Okay, good evening, everybody. Lieutenant Gugala, uh, I'm first again tonight. Um, with regard to entering information into your squitters, uh, Mission Scanner's doing this a little bit differently. Uh, Major Loy is going to enter the tasks at the end of the exam on Friday or sometime afterwards. Um, I have received some automated requests for validation from some of you uh, through your uh, through your squitters. Don't enter your tasks right now. We still have to get through the last day with the exam. So that'll be taken care of. So an amendment to that statement that was in the first slide is when this is all over with, after a reasonable period of time, make sure all of the tasks that you think that you are eligible for have been entered. And if not, then we'll start figuring out what we need to do there. So please don't, uh, don't enter any squitter tasks for Mission Scanner. Okay, let me get my presentation up here for just a moment. I'm gonna turn my camera off. Okay, Colonel Thirty Acre, can you see the uh, the whole presentation or the slide, or is it cut off at all? Nope, you're good. Okay, very good. Here we go. All right, we're in the home stretch, folks. Definitely going to be the fire hose again today. We're going to move in a lot of different directions. We're going to start with a discussion about weather from the scanner's perspective. We're going to talk about uh, visibility reduced visibility and the effects of uh, it on just the air ops and the search operations, uh, precautions for flight during reduced visibility conditions, and that's task P20, uh, correction, P2023. We're gonna describe how turbulence can affect search operations, that's P2023 also. And we're gonna describe the dangers of thunderstorms, which uh, frankly isn't listed in either of these, but you need to know about it. At the end of this uh, lesson, you should be able to discuss the uh, visibility issues that we talk about. You um, should also be able to discuss turbulence in flight and the effects on ops. And successfully pass an evaluation by a uh, mission scanner set on task P2023. And as I said, uh, if you stick with us, that'll be done on Friday with a, with a paper evaluation. This is not going to be a deep dive into causes of weather, cold fronts, pressure systems, that kind of stuff. This is a graze over some of the highlights that you as a scanner are gonna to wanna to keep in mind so that you are an informed crew member uh, for two reasons. One, so that you can weigh in on decisions that the crew may need to make regarding weather effects on the mission that you're trying to accomplish. And also for your own personal comfort and safety, uh, Everybody has limits, uh, especially for, as an example, if uh, you're prone to air sickness during turbulence, uh, you may need to beg out of a flight uh, simply because the weather forecast uh, is gonna be a little beyond your comfort level in the back of the aircraft. Um, and then the other reason would be uh, so that you can support uh, the flight crew in their decisions for, uh, for proceeding or canceling a flight, just having a basic knowledge. Ultimately, it is the responsibility of the pilot to determine whether or not the weather is safe enough for the flight to take place. The mission observer and the scanner, and as well as the pilot, um, can add addendum to that if the flight can take place but may not necessarily be possible to get your mission accomplished, then there's no reason to go. So an informed crew can discuss these matters all together as a team. Most important aspect of weather is, is, is its impact on the flight conditions, primarily and especially in the area of flight visibility, the ability to see outside of the aircraft, not just for scanning, but for safely operating the aircraft as the pilot. So in our past discussions, we've talked about ourselves, how we're physically ready to go do the job or not, uh, the equipment that we're gonna be using in terms of the aircraft and the avionics and gauges and all the fun stuff inside. 
And we've talked about uh, how to scan the ground and some of the phenomenon with uh, optical illusions and stuff to get the job done. Now you've made it out to the airport. The next big question is, how's the weather out there? Is it legal to fly? Is it safe to fly? And can we see to do our job? So as a newcomer or a, uh, a scanner, and I understand that there's pilots out there and a lot of different qualifications, but as, uh, as a person in the back, the two main things you're going to be worried about is cloud cover or ceiling and how well can we see visibility. The main hazard for cloud cover is potential for loss of visibility. This is all about what, how we see outside. We operate under what's referred to as visual flight rules or VFR. The pilot operates the aircraft in visual flight rules primarily by looking outside. He uses visual, he or she uses visual cues for horizon, for moving the aircraft from point A to point B and, and navigation. And in some instances, maintaining a safe altitude at the basic level, avoiding obstacles and terrain. You can do all of these things without the instruments in the aircraft safely. Airspeed is the one thing you can't do by sticking your finger out the window of the aircraft. So if we want to pick nits, you do need that, uh, that piece of equipment to fly the aircraft safely for the most part. Visual flight rules are defined by the FAA in basic terms for basic VFR. You're worried about ceiling and you have to have a space between the ground and the bottom of the clouds of a thousand feet or better. So in basic VFR, a thousand feet above ground level to the base of the clouds is the space you have to have minimum to operate. You're also concerned with horizontal visibility. <coughs> Correct, <coughs> excuse me, I have a little bit of a tickle. Um, we're concerned about horizontal visibility or flight visibility and the FAA defines safe VFR flight visibility as three miles of horizontal. Now, again, I know there's pilots out there. I know there's aviation enthusiasts and uh, anybody who uh, was following the uh, Kobe Bryant tragedy uh, out west, there are other forms of VFR that, uh, that exist. A special VFR was the term that was thrown around there. This is not something that we're really gonna deal with today. Uh, especially when you're dealing with search ops. If we don't have a thousand feet and three miles horizontal flight visibility, you're generally not going to be able to search very well for anything. Um, so for our purposes, thousand and three is our rule of thumb for special or for normal VFR per the FARs. And of course, CAP's going to get in there as well. Uh, there's a CAP regulation that will tell us our limitations for flying visually. You're going to find that the 1003 is also our limitation. And if you think, re review back to uh, day one, what regulation is going to tell us about our limitations? And that is CAP 70-1, 70-1 for crew limitations. So let's start this off a little bit uh, by talking about that cloud cover, that thousand foot ceiling. And what is a ceiling? A ceiling is exactly that, the roof, the top, the, the area you're going to bump into, that reduction in visibility caused by clouds. Now, clouds come in many, many different forms. You've got few to scattered clouds. You've got broken clouds. We've got overcast clouds. And if we got to open the weather books, we can break those down even further into the types of clouds. From a technical aspect, a ceiling does not occur. You do not have a ceiling until you have a cloud cover defined as a broken layer or worse. A broken layer uh, is 
deemed when you have five eighths cloud coverage all the way up to seven eighths. Anything after that is overcast and uh, just as much as ceiling. But less than that, something like a scattered layer or few clouds is not a ceiling. And if your weather report or your visual, once you're in the air, is it's evident that this is uh, a scattered layer. It's obvious that a plane can get through this layer of clouds without flying into them and maintaining side to side distance. You can go fly. If you have something that's in the broken category or worse, it's not the end of the world. We just need to know at what altitude those clouds are at. The weather reports and the information that the pilots can get uh, to determine that uh, is now front and center. And then there's one more thing. Under the normal VFR or correction, normal VFR uh, uh, rules of operation, we need to maintain a distance of 500 feet below that ceiling uh, in order to operate legally and safely. And again, the pilots out there know that there's some things that uh, that you can do as a normal VFR pilot uh, in different airspaces. But for CAP, if you look at 70-1, you will find that we need to maintain a distance of 500 feet below those clouds before we can operate with a ceiling. Um, that's going to be important because if you have a ceiling that's 1,000 feet from ground to uh, the base, you are not going to be able to operate um, within that window and maintain the 500 feet below because now you are 500 feet above the ground and we're not supposed to operate there either. We typically search at 1,000 feet with a momentary descent to five if we see a point of interest. And one last time, where do you think we'll find this? 70-1. So reduction of visibility is not just about the clouds. It's not just about flying into a cloud. It's also about atmospheric conditions that can hinder and reduce our flight visibility. We talked about some of these during the um, presentations on techniques for scanning and some of the uh, phenomenon that will change how you see the ground. And we're going to roll through some of these real quick here. Fog. I'm sure most of you have had opportunity to drive in the fog. Uh, it's no fun. It's a lot more fun when you're in the air trying to figure out how to find the ground. So if you come out to the airport and you see something like this here, you're going to be waiting or possibly not going. But most, more importantly, uh, this is a picture of fog rolling in off of Lake Michigan into the city of Chicago. Uh, those of us who are operating in Illinois uh, in this uh, zone of effect may encounter this. It's pretty cool to see. It's fun to watch um, unless it happens to be floating over the airport that you're getting ready to land at. So watching your weather forecast and being aware when you're on a coastal area that this could occur is, uh, is something you want to keep in mind with regard to fog. Fog typically forms in still air um, when the temperature and the dew point are very close together, and that's what you're going to find here. This type of fog actually uh, is, uh, is a moving air phenomenon where you've got uh, two different air masses, hot and cold, coming together uh, on the coast. So um, something to watch, something to be concerned about. Haze. It's haze season. Um, most of the people on our course list are, are Midwesterners or as far down south as Texas. We know what haze is, especially in the heat. Um, and there's really no way around it. It's pollution and particles in the air. Uh, and as you can see from this slide, it really has an effect on your visibility, primarily the lack of a horizon. From the air, this is what haze will look like. I, mean, I know we saw some of these when we were studying the scanner uh, techniques. 
Um, and as you can see, our visibility gets worse and worse as we look out towards the horizon. Um, this is a challenge for the pilots. It is not the end of the world. Um, during the summertime, if you are not planning to fly in the haze, you're not gonna fly much at all. Uh, it can be done. It can be done quite safely, but uh, it is gonna have an effect on your operations and bring the tempo of the, uh, the cruise vigilance up that much more. Another thing that can happen with haze is uh, it can obscure uh, potential weather that is inbound or, or near you. Uh, this is a picture that's in the, of a distance away, but let's say you're operating closer to this thunderstorm in the haze uh, and you are not using any uh, next rad radar or, uh, or, or weather overlays, you may not see this coming. So something to be mindful, a way to mitigate this is to know your forecast, know what the potential for uh, thunderstorms on any given day are going to be. Dust. I know we have a couple people in here from Texas. Uh, dust storms are a thing. Uh, they can get up to uh, 15,000 feet and cover hundreds of miles. When you're in them, the effects are the same as fog and haze. You lose your horizon. You can lose your uh, uh, horizontal visibility considerably, almost down to zero. So dust storms are uh, something that uh, will also affect your in-flight visibility. And those of us who are up north, I know some folks from Minnesota and Illinois, we get the same thing here, um, blowing snow and or whiteouts. Uh, these uh, can be exaggerated, especially on a sunny day when you get sun reflection, um, making things difficult to operate, difficult to see, and uh, a safety of flight issue. So in order to stay ahead of these phenomenon and to still operate safely, get your missions accomplished when it is possible, is to get your weather briefings. Primarily the job of the pilot and the observer, but with these basic things that you as the scanner need to worry about, you're involved in this information gathering process too. The weather briefings can come from uh, the flight service stations, which the pilot can contact. Uh, they can be got online uh, through the same uh, flight service information they can put that that is published um, on a hour by hour basis. In some cases, uh, there are times where new forecasts are published and you can update your briefings. Large incidents and exercises might have a weather department. You can get a briefing from a weather observer or a, a, uh, a cap weather person attached to the IC. But all of these resources need to be used, need to be used effectively, and need to be used as often as necessary. Don't look in the morning for an afternoon flight, especially in the summertime when there's thunderstorms and haze, uh, and expect that weather to not have changed without updating your briefings. Update as necessary. Another thing to consider if you're operating in a limited visibility day is to use crew resource management. We're gonna talk a little bit about that later on in, in the presentation today. Um, but in a nutshell, it's delegating responsibilities and tasks in order to spread the load and to make everybody that much more safe, that much more efficient. Um, <clears throat> So the pilot may ask the scanner, hey, it's a hazy day. I need you, need you to look out in this area of the aircraft and watch for things like towers. Uh, that may be uh, a hazard to our, our flight and, and difficult to see because of the haze. Other traffic, um, terrain. And all of these things you're going to want to watch for during the critical phases of flight, such as takeoff, uh, climb out, descent and landing. If you are in route and you're running at a lower altitude, we can also consider that a, a critical phase of flight since you may be operating around some of the highest towers that uh, are along your route. So let's talk about turbulence. It's a fact of flying. It's there. There's nothing we can do about it, and we're going to have to live with it. So 
there are two causes of turbulence, mechanical and thermal. Mechanical turbulence is caused by wind bumping into terrain and objects on the ground. Uh, mountainous regions, cities, even forests and trees around airports will uh, often find mechanical turbulence. And thermal, thermal turbulence, and again, along with the haze, this time of year is thermal turbulence season. Uh, if you're a, a glider pilot or a soarer, this is your season because thermal turbulence is caused by uneven heating of the atmosphere, creating columns of air that are hotter or warmer than the ones surrounding them, and you get heat rise. And because of those differences in the densities of those columns of air, they basically create little road bump, speed bumps in the in the air for the, for the crew, uh, for the aircraft. So you kind of bump it along, you feel one, and then it's all calm, and then you feel another one. That's thermal turbulence. Um, mountain flying has a special type of turbulence, uh, especially on the downside of the mountain. We're going to talk about that in a slide, uh, in just a couple of slides. But um, us flatlanders will also experience uh, wind-driven mechanical turbulence, especially around an airport on a windy day. If you're coming in and things are feeling pretty smooth in that wind, uh, if the airport has forest or terrain around it, once you get close to the ground, you may get jostled around quite a bit. Turbulence, no matter which form it comes in, uh, poses some challenges, not only to just general comfort and operation, but to safety. Turbulence can range from uh, a minor nuisance to a severe threat to the to the safety of the crew and the aircraft. Um, not only structurally for the airplane, but if you get jostled around enough, you could you could injure yourself. So knowing what you're getting into on a turbulent day uh, and looking for those turbulent rep turbulence reports is going to be important. Uh, the uh, weather forecasting systems will predict turbulence. But you really don't know what you're getting unless you ref refer to pilot reports from people who have been there, done that, and got bounced around by it. So on a summer day, it's always going to be good to check the pyreps, is what we call them, for uh, turbulence. You as a scanner, as a opportunity for uh, just being a professional, are going to want to know how much you're going to get bounced around on a turbulent day because if you can't see outside the airplane, uh, you're probably not going to be able to do your job because you're getting your eyeballs are getting knocked around. So you're going to want to consider these things from a professional standpoint, also not just uh, a safety of flight. Severe turbulence can cause structural damage to the aircraft, uh, and even moderate turbulence poses a threat if it's consistent enough. And then, of course, I, I keep jumping ahead on my slides, uh, a form of mechanical turbulence that uh, we discussed back in uh, airport operations is uh, wake turbulence caused by large aircraft and uh, or large fast aircraft and the wingtip vortices that come across. So there's another form of mechanical turbulence that we've discussed. Referring to the mountains, um, the thing you need to be aware of is the downside of a mountain range. When the wind comes across, you can get severe downdrafts, very strong. And if you're motoring through here in your Cessna 172, you can become a downgoing elevator very quickly. And depending on the train below, could be catastrophic. Typically, you want to clear ridges and peaks at 2,000 feet if possible. Uh, those of you who are operating in mountain areas, I am not going to pretend to be an expert in this area with these aircraft. You'll need to refer to your uh, local crew members to get a better feel for how you fly in your, your mountainous terrain. As I said, turbulence ranges from minor nuisance to dangerous to safety. It can reduce the effectiveness of the scanner um, by increasing your fatigue and just bouncing you around. If you can't keep your eyeballs on the ground, which is our primary mission, uh, then uh, you're not as effective as you can be. Uh, keeping in mind, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, uh, possibility of detection in, uh, in your scanning in, in, with, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Lieutenant Citadino. And you're gonna be 
surprised to find that our possibility of detection isn't very high. So we're going out there already with the deck stacked against us. And if you're getting bounced around in moderate turbulence, you, you may be zero effective. Um, we need to plan flights around terrain carefully. We just talked about mountain ranges and uh, clearing ridges by 2,000 feet. When turbulence does affect operations, speak up. Please let your crew know what's going on with you or with your mission. Let fellow crew know if, you, if turbulence is affecting your health. If you're not feeling well, if you're going to be sick, nobody wants that to happen. Uh, so before it gets too bad, say something. Um, professionally, if it's just not working out and you can't see what's going on on the ground, you may want to discuss this with the crew. You know, maybe the observer's got a, a, a gyro gimbaled head and he can keep his eyes focused. But if you are not effective, the crew needs to know that you're not effective. And of course, as we talked about safety, um, in order to mitigate some of the effects of turbulence, as I said, it's going to be there. You can't turn it off with a switch. And generally, if you're going to climb to an altitude to get out of it, now you're climbing out of your zone of effective scanning. So bring a six sack in case the worst happens. Um, you can't ask for another altitude, maybe for a break, or if you discuss it with the crew, maybe if you've only got to go up a couple hundred feet to get out of the turbulence, it may still allow for an effective scan. Um, use the vents or windows in the aircraft to keep air flowing over your face. Uh, please, though, ask the pilot before using a window. There are limitations to the speeds uh, that we can use or that we can operate some of those windows. And sometimes you just flat out have to return to base. Uh, if you're sick, if it's not happening, if uh, you're not able to see and you're spending too much time dancing around in the sky, uh, request a return to base is always an option. Oh, we've talked about cloud cover and visibility, and we've talked about getting bounced around. The aviator's second arch enemy after gravity is a combination of all of these things, the thunderstorm. The thunderstorm is a high energy force of nature that is always a threat to aviators, uh, whether it's in the developing stage or it's finally gone past mature and is just flat out dissipating and coming apart. It is not something to be messed with, not something to take, especially a small airplane anywhere near. Uh, even in the beginning stages, you have threats to visibility by flying in or around the clouds, which, you know, it's just like fog. You also have turbulent threats as the updrafts are building the thunderstorm. As the thunderstorm matures, everything really starts to get crazy. Not only do you have updraft turbulence, you've got downdraft turbulence. All of this can be very severe, very abrupt, not to mention the rain and the other things that come thrown out of this cloud mass at the same time. And then finally, in the dissipating stage of the thunderstorm, uh, it, all of these phenomena increase, especially the downdraft. Downdrafts, that can be so strong that they'll push the airplane directly into the ground. And we've got uh, uh, cases, uh, specifically in American Airlines, a uh, case that was uh, an accident because uh, they hit a microburst and ended up uh, being smashed into the ground instead of the runway that they were trying to land on. Thunderstorms are not something to play with. As a result, we want to keep clear 20 miles from a thunderstorm. And this is a fantastic picture uh, as you're assuming that the worst of this thing is in the center of the uh, dissipation. You may be tempted to come around the thunderstorm through any of these gaps underneath the shelf of the clouds. It's not a good idea. You can still experience severe turbulence and wind shear and wind changes in this area and lightning. So you want to give these things a wide berth of about 20 miles. So to summarize, you want to know the weather before you go. Get your briefings. Get your information. Make sure the pilot gives you the information you need to do your job in the back and to be comfortable, uh, pilot or the observer, know what you're getting into before you climb into the aircraft so that you can do your job and that you can be safe. 
Um, each member of the air crew needs to take a, a role in keeping the aircraft safe uh, by being vigilant during all phases of flight, especially the critical ones uh, if reduced visibility is at play. Know what visibility you're getting into, especially in the search area, so that you can establish how you're going to be effective in your job. Uh, it may be different than assumed. It's, it's not uncommon for us to get a report on the ground uh, through our, uh, our weather services of what they mathematically believe the visibility to be without any pilot reports and to get in the air and find out that, um, you know what, it's not what we expected. And the worst case of that is to get in the air and being told that it's three and a half miles visibility and it's barely one. Uh, in that case, even though the numbers on paper say you've got three miles visibility, you really need to turn around and get back on the ground because if you do not have three miles flight visibility, you are not operating legally. Um, visibility conditions or turbulence may increase your fatigue. We talked about that. And uh, last time, give thunderstorms plenty of room. Do we have any questions regarding a very basic go over of the weather phenomenon you got to worry about as a scanner? Okay. Uh, you, you had a couple questions in the chat. Okay. I can't see it, so can you read them? Yeah, first one is how likely is it for things like dust clouds or, or haze cone um, in in unexpectedly after you have uh, take, taken off? Well, dust, uh, having not flown in the Southwest much and having not experienced it, I'm gonna make an assumption. Dust is something that can be seen and forecast. Uh, I believe that uh, you'll get some pre-warning. Haze is haze. Uh, on a summer day, it's typically not going to just appear at a point where you, know, you, you weren't expecting it. In the morning, it can be a little better than uh, towards the afternoon, but it'll be kind of a, an uptick as you go. It's, uh, it's not going to come rolling in like a fog. Uh, well, a dust storm can. As you saw in that picture, it'll come rolling in. But uh, haze, you're generally stuck with what you got. As the sun gets higher, it can cause some problems with uh, reflection, but the, the amount of particles in the air are generally going to be the same. Okay. Next one is says, is that nautical or statutory miles? I think that meant um, how far should you avoid this th from the thunderstorms? How far should you be back? Oh, well, it, with a 1.15 difference in nautical and statute miles, just make it nautical miles because when you're working as an air crew, you're talking in nautical miles anyway. Uh, nautical miles, 20 miles. Yeah. And that's what all of your uh, guidance information on your, on your GPS and stuff is running in as well. Yeah. Last one says... Can the pilots file IFR if needed to return to base? If the pilot is qualified not only with a license and uh, a certification for instrument flying and a CAP IFR pilot, if you get up there and let's say hypothetically, like myself, I'm, I'm an instrument rated pilot, but I'm not a CAP instrument pilot. Uh, if I were to go up there for safety reasons and have to file an IFR flight plan to get us down, I will do that. However, um, I'm going to have to deal with the incident report because I deviated from cap rules uh, to uh, to get us back on the ground since I am not a cap instrument pilot. Um, the, the answer to that question is, more importantly, get your briefings, know what you're getting into to the best of your ability. And generally, a good pilot's going to be able to say, you know, we have the potential to get stuck. Um, it's a good question in as an addendum, uh, let's say you're out there and what was forecast as a scattered layer of clouds turns into a broken layer of clouds and you end up uh, potentially on top of that layer. Uh, that's gonna be a problem. However, um, from where you came, you can generally turn back and get yourself back down. Always know what's coming and do your best to make the plans, and that's where the pilot and the observer come in, in terms of being able to interpret how that weather is going to change. And that's the last of the questions from the chat. I don't know if it may also have any others. Okay, if, if we do, let's, we'll slide them in during the break. Uh, I'm going to continue with our next section, and then, uh, and then I've got a break built in. Okay, uh, temperature, humidity, and high altitude considerations 
Um, this doesn't refer to aircraft performance. This is going to be how these uh, phenomena can affect you as an individual in the aircraft. So we're going to discuss the symptoms and dangers of dehydration and the strategies used to combat its effects, discuss the symptoms and dangers of ear block, sinus block, and hypoxia, and talk a little bit about uh, reducing those effects as well. And again, our goal at the end is for you to be able to uh, successfully pass an evaluation uh, on these uh, tasks. And in this case, it'll be task 20 P, excuse, excuse me, P is in Papa 2024. Um, but more importantly, if you can pass the evaluation, that means you've got the knowledge and we want you to have the knowledge. You need to be safe. And this is a safety of uh, flight, safety of person uh, little segment. Dehydration. Pretty sure we're all familiar with the term. It's the loss of water in the body, uh, either through um, temperature on a sunny day where you're sweating and you're not taking in as much as you're putting out, or it can be very subtle on, uh, say, a winter day where you are losing water. You're always losing water through the skin. You're breathing out in droplets through your lungs, uh, through your kidneys. It never stops. You're always losing some kind of water. Um, in the summertime, it's a little easier to spot because of uh, our sweat and the dehydration comes a little faster, a little more uh, severe. But in the wintertime, it can, uh, can also occur because we tend to drink less water because we're not sweating. We're not feeling like we're becoming dehydrated. It will also increase in altitude because as you climb, you're going to lose uh Humidity, your, um, yeah, humidity drops and the air becomes less dense. Uh, so these things, you, you won't even detect the evaporation of the sweat. Uh, symptoms are going to be dryness of the tissues. You may feel some eye irritation, nose and throat dryness. Um, you may develop a headache. I when I get dehydrated, I typically start to get a headache. Um, and, uh, you know, you may also feel a rapid heart rate. Strategies to combat dehydration. And if we'll think back to lesson number one, two, three weeks ago, and don't forget to hydrate. Drink plenty of fluids. Experts recommend drinking 13 to 20 ounces of fluid. That's three to five mouthful, mouthfuls 30 minutes before leaving. Four to six ounces, a, a couple of mouthfuls every 15 minutes thereafter. Now, of course, uh, depending on how long your flight is and how much fluid you really think you're putting out, uh, you got to get to know your body because that could lead to another problem if you take in too many, too much liquids, and that is... Uh, the, the lack of uh, lavatory facilities at 3,000 feet on a search in an area that's two hours away from your home airport. So this is a, an area where you just, you just need to get to know your body. Bring water with you. Um, also, you can increase airflow over the vent, out of the vents and windows to reduce your temperature on a summer day and minimize sweating. And uh, if the search objective allows... Again, you can reduce your temperature by climbing to a higher altitude. Don't forget to hydrate. Also, prior to taking on the mission, avoid caffeinated beverages, Cokes, energy drinks, tea, chocolate, things that contain caffeine. Caffeine will increase your rate of dehydration. Ear block. The next two things we're going to talk about, ear block and sinus, uh, sinus problems generally are going to occur if you are congested. Um, ear block is caused by a constriction in the eustachian tube, caused by congestion. Um, makes it difficult to equalize the pressure in the ears as you climb and descend. It can produce severe pain and loss of hearing that can last from several hours to several days. You can also potentially rupture an eardrum. Be very careful if you're coming out to fly and you're sniffly. Uh, I would suggest not flying at all. Ear block. Um, 
to prevent it, or I'm sorry, not to prevent it, to uh, maybe relieve it. You can yawn, you can swallow, you can tense the muscles in your throat, you know, exercise all those muscles you never really thought you had direct control over to try and get those eustachian tubes to uh, open up and relieve the pressure. There's also a uh, technique called the Valsalva maneuver where you hold your nose, close your mouth, and blow through, try and blow through your nose, which will change the pressure in your ears. I've had tremendous success with that in my years of flying uh, when I really am having a blockage that I can't deal with. So uh, these are techniques that, uh, that will help. Sinus block. Um, I've experienced this uh, when I was flying professionally. Uh, I've, I've had a, a couple of instances where this became a problem. Um, sinus congestion makes pressure equalization difficult, particularly during descent. Uh, and it can produce severe pain. And in some cases, it can uh, uh, cause tears in your sinus cavities or damage to your sinus cavities. It's a result, again, of pressures not being able to equalize in your inner head due to uh, congestion. If you do experience either a sinus block or an ear block, sinus block especially, you may ask your pilot to climb back up a little bit and sometimes it will relieve and attempt a slightly less, uh, or sli a slightly lower rate of descent uh, into your destination going back down. Not gonna work all the time, but sometimes it, it can help you out. Again, if you're not feeling well, don't fly. Um, there's other days we can go. Uh, if you are on a real deal mission, now you need to weigh uh, what could happen. How stuffy are you? How, uh, how much is this going to affect? Because if you get up there and you find out that uh, because uh, you got an ear block that's severe or a sinus block that's severe, you are no longer effective. Um, you know, maybe there was another crew member that probably should have gone that, on that flight to give you 100% effectivity. So just, uh, I know everybody's gung-ho to do the job and to get it done, but if you're not 100%, if you can't go through I'm safe uh, checklist and get past that uh, congestion situation, then uh, you probably should not go. Also, uh, medication is typically not effective. Um, I know I, the, the, uh, the, congestants drive me crazy. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. And irregardless, many of them have, uh, have side effects that uh, will also cause you to uh, trip a, a level on your I'm safe checklist by um, either being drowsy or medicated. So I know you're going to try. I know you want to get up there, but really weigh the situation before you get going. The third effect of uh, altitude um, is hypoxia. This is a lack of oxygen to the brain. Not a huge concern for us as cap search uh, air crew because we are running at such low altitudes. You usually we're operating below 12,000 feet MSL. Um, you typically don't start worrying about hypoxia until you hit around 10,000 feet. Uh, then you start thinking about it and then around 14,000 feet, you've gotta be on oxygen. Um, can have a loss of night vision as low as 5,000 feet. So, you know, you, uh, you aren't necessarily hypoxic below 5,000 feet, but uh, the, the oxygen is reduced to the brain to a point where it's starting to, to affect uh, things like night vision. We have no built-in warning system against hypoxia. Um, I would encourage all of you to YouTube some of the videos of uh, uh, the altitude chambers that, um, I know there's one at Wright Patterson Air Force Base. It's, it's kind of uh, interesting to see when they put uh, a pilot through uh, the altitude hypoxia training, um, they give them all these neat little puzzles and things to try and work out, but they're usually very simple, things like sorting cards or stacking blocks. And uh, the effects uh, on the uh, crew members that are being put to the uh, test uh, are almost like watching uh, a room full of drunks. They um, they definitely lose uh, lose their faculties and um, are are kind of fun to watch. But it's an interesting uh, interesting thing to see, and it just suddenly happens. I mean, none of these people really know what's going on with them. They're just being silly. So take a look at that, get a feel for it. 
strategies to combat hypoxia. So let's go back to that idea of even below 5,000 feet, you start to lose some of your effectiveness with night vision. Um, you know, if you're a smoker, uh, you know, if you uh, were out the night before and were drinking, but within your obvious 70-1 limits for alcohol before flying, um, if you are uh, maybe taking cough medicine, mild depressants, uh, you may find that uh, you display some of the what would be mild symptoms of hypoxia because you have a limited or a lesser uh, flow of oxygen to your brain. If you do find that you're just not feeling right, whether you're at 5,000 feet or 18,000 feet, oxygen is going to be the best cure. Uh, and again, uh, avoid smoking and uh, alcohol, especially if you know you're going to be going on a mission. And that, we'll take a break before we start talking about navigation. Um, do we have any questions? None in the chat, so. Okay, very good. Um, let's see, it's... Uh, uh, 1950-ish right now. Why don't we come back at uh, straight up uh, 2000, please?
I can't see how many of you are back yet. I know we have a couple more minutes left. Uh, the slide up here now, uh, Lieutenant Cittadino has put up uh, just some information on the scanner test that will be next Wednesday. Uh, it's a 50 question test, all multiple choice or true false. It'll be coming in the form of a uh, Google Sheets. Um, passing grade is 80%. It's an open book test. Once again, it's an open book test. Uh, if you remember last week, we talked about uh, different signaling techniques and stuff that uh, you're definitely not going to memorize. Uh, you're going to want to try and have uh, that information readily available. Uh, all of this stuff is in your uh, air crew reference text. So um, that's the main book you're going to want to have. But uh, again, an open book test. Uh, some of the stuff we're about to talk about. Uh, the sectionals uh, will will address, and then as I mentioned at the beginning of the class, Major Loy will complete the squitters after the results of the tests come in. Colonel 30 Acre, can you see the faces? Do we have everybody back in? I can only see a handful. Problem is with, with something being shared, it cuts out half the screen. Like yeah. I see like 10 people. Okay. Yeah, so that's a problem with this system. Like right. other well, systems, you can scan through everybody, but I haven't found out how to do that yet. No, yeah, I, I agree. Um, well, what do you want for nothing, right? Yep. Okay, we got one minute left. We'll start it straight up uh, 2000, 8 o'clock, and uh, move on to uh, navigation. I see the slides down, so up comes uh, my presentation again. Okay, do we have contact? It looks like you're showing weather again. Yep, that's okay. It's all in the same loop. Oh. I hope I hope okay. I hope it would it would have gone to the slide that I wanted it to, but uh, again, I can't have everything. Okay. Uh, Steve? Yes, sir. Uh, I don't know what other people are seeing. I'm only seeing half your slide. Press. I'm seeing like half the slide. Half uh, the slide. Okay. Well, I mean, that's uh, cut off. Looks like it's cut off. Okay. Let me try this. Yes. How about that? Now, now the slide's full screen. Okay. Very good. Thank you for bringing that up. Okay. Oh, now we're at weather again. All right. Uh, Navigation and position determination. Okay, so now we're finally in the air. <laughs> where do we go and how do we get there and where are we at? E objectives. We're going to talk about some basic terms uh, for na uh, navigation, which is going to be under task O2025. We're going to get into using a sectional, uh, discussing how to identify objects on the, uh, on the sectional and position. We'll talk a little bit about the uh, legend and the physical features that are depicted on the uh, sectional chart. It's all about the sectional today. Lots of uh, lots of information there. Um, we're going to talk about heading, distance between two points. Uh, let's see. 
and the goals. At the end of this section, uh, you should be able to demonstrate general knowledge of the use of a sectional chart and its symbols for navigation. Demonstrate proficiency in the use of a sectional chart for position, location, and communication of position. And successfully pass an evaluation by an MS set on tasks uh, 2025. I don't believe there's an end in there. Navigation terms. We're going to start out with uh, course, which is the planned or actual path of the aircraft over the ground. Um, mainly it's the planned path of the aircraft over the ground. Uh, the actual, yeah, I'm sorry, planned and actual path of the aircraft over the ground. Uh, we can discuss this in terms of a true course or magnetic course, which we'll talk about in a little more detail shortly. We're going to combine that with the heading, which is the direction the aircraft is pointing. The ground track, which is the actual path of the aircraft over the ground. So let's put all of that together. The heading, I'm um, correction, the uh, course is the line from point A to point B. I start here and I want to get to here. That is our course. If there is no wind, you can generally point your aircraft in that direction and the heading that you have on your compass or your heading indicator is going to be the same as the course that you are trying to fly. These are depicted in degrees, zero all the way around to 290 and shortly up to 360. Actually, there is no zero, it's 360. 360 all the way around the compass rows. If you have a wind, just like with a boat, an airplane suffers from uh, being shoved around by the forces acting against it. So if your course from point A to point B, in this example is 360, and you have a wind from your left, you may find that even though your compass is pointing 360, you are not tracking 360. You are moving slightly sideways on a diagonal from the course. So we need to correct our heading to compensate for the wind that's blowing us away. And typically, well, always we turn into the wind a certain amount of degrees and it's trial and error until the pilot gets it uh, settled in so that your course and your track over the ground are the same, 360 in this case, your compass is going to show something different than that. So again, course is where you want to go. Track is where the airplane's actually going, depending on how you've pointed it and whether or not there's wind acting against you. And the heading is the direction that the aircraft is pointed, but not necessarily the track that it's flying. And again, here's just a simpler diagram. Point A to point B, your desired course. No wind, that'll match your heading. If you have a wind, you're now going to have a different track than your course. You compensate by changing your heading into the wind, and now your track will be the same as your course. We call this crabbing into the wind because you're kind of walking sideways like a crab. You crab into the wind to maintain the course that you want to track. As I mentioned, this is depicted in compass rows headings based on either true north or magnetic north. The difference being true north is the North Pole, um, where you send your letters to Santa Claus. That's where the Earth uh, rotates on its Imaginary axis through the, the is true north. Magnetic north is with regard to the magnetic uh, characteristics of the Earth, and it is slightly south and east. Uh, correction, west of true north. So as you can see, if you're in Chicago and you set your compass to north, intending to go see Santa Claus, you are going to end up 
somewhat short of your destination in northern Canada. Magnetic North <clears throat> is uh, followed using the compass. Compass is typically going to be mounted on the aircraft up above the instrument panel. It's either going to be attached here. Sometimes they'll sit down there. There's some different styles and different faces, but know that this lone instrument that's usually sitting somewhere on the top of your instrument panel is your compass. Uh, when all else fails, the compass is going to be there. So um, the pilot knows how to compensate for this deviation in magnetic north that he, you will see on the charts uh, to uh, reference true north. And we do all of our activities referencing true north. Typically, magnetic north is going to be uh, when you're talking about runways. Runways are aligned to uh, magnetic north, but all of our actions and our ops are done referencing true north. And uh, part of uh, an observer's task is to uh, set the GPS in the aircraft to, uh, to a true north default uh, for your, for your um, scanning uh, patterns and your, your, your search patterns. As the question was asked before regarding uh, circling around thunderstorms, we as uh, air crew and aviators deal in nautical miles. Uh, it's a measurement used in air navigation since the beginning of air navigation, and it was taken from the, uh, from the sailors. So uh, nautical mile is our standard of measurement for distance. And as a result, our standard of measurement for speed is in knots, which is nautical miles per hour. Um, slightly longer, than a nautical or that a statute mile slightly faster than a statute mile. A statute mile is five thousand two hundred eighty feet. The nautical mile is six thousand seventy six feet. One knot equals one nautical mile per hour. You may have to convert, especially if you're working with a ground team that needs to know something in statute miles. Um, oops. To convert nautical miles to statute miles. Uh, you basically multiply the nautical by 1.15. Uh, so as an example, if you've got five nautical miles, uh, that translates to five and three quarters statute miles. If you're going to convert uh, in the opposite direction, you need to do division. Oh, no, more math. Uh, if you've got five statute miles, you've got a little bit less in your nautical miles, 4.35. And, of course, if you're dealing with speed, same thing, you're using 1.15 as your reference number. Uh, if you've got uh, wanting to convert knots to miles per hour, you multiply. If you're wanting to convert uh, miles per hour to uh, nautical, you divide. So locating a position, we're all about where we're at. Where are we at? Where are we going? Where is the uh, target at? Where is the find at? We need to be able to convey that in some manner that everybody's going to understand. So we use uh, the lat latitude, longitude lines of, of uh, <clears throat> markings on our map. They're imaginary lines. Some run north and south. Those are your lines of latitude. And others run east and west, your lines of longitude. Uh, and where they meet defines a point on the earth that we use as a reference for position. As a rule, by convention, latitude is always stated first. And those are going to either be your north, and since we're CAP, there should be no reason we should be uh, reporting anything in south latitude. They're always going to be north, so your reports are going to be north such and such and west such and such. We'll get to a little more in detail on that in just a moment. The lines of latitude run east and west. So this would be the way they run across the earth. Starts at zero at the equator and increases to 90 degrees north all the way to the poles. So 90 degree north and then it would be 90 degrees south in the opposite direction. But these are our lines of latitude.
Think of it this way, lateral, latitude, lateral running side to side. So your lines of latitude are side to side. Longitude, however, runs north and south. An easy way to remember them is they're the long lines. If we go back, oops, your lines of latitude, oops, your lines of latitude will decrease in circumference as you go to the top of the earth, with the exception of the equator, which is the same all the way around. Um, your lines of longitude are going to be the same distance all the way around the Earth. We reference them by starting with zero. Zero is uh, located in Greenwich, England, or goes through Greenwich, England. Um, again, dating back to uh, the Mariners and uh, the English or the British Empire. Uh, kind of making the rules. So whenever you talk about uh, Zulu time is a off topic example. We're talking about the time in Greenwich, England, uh, uh, standard mean time, because that's where it all begins. Everything starts um, with the prime meridian is what we call this line of zero longitude on the earth. They increase as you move away west to east in 10 degree increments as a standard with uh, all the little increments in between. So around the earth, you're gonna go with your lines of longitude until you get to the other side, which is gonna be 180. So west 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, all the way to west 179. And then you've got 180. The other direction, it'll be east and so forth. How we take these two imaginary magic lines and turn them into something that we can decipher and communicate is called coordinates. Coordinates are depicted in degrees, minutes, and seconds each degree equaling 60 minutes, one minute equaling 60 seconds. We typically use minutes in decimal form in CAP. Rarely will you be saying seconds. However, if you are under pressure, if you need to get something out quickly, uh, by all means, uh, if you happen to have it written down in de uh, degrees, minutes, and seconds, give that as well. Uh, you, once you uh, work on your observer training, there are uh, you'll be trained on how to convert uh, the different forms of coordinate reports uh, into. There's a couple of different decimal forms also. Again, always bring the latitude first, so everything is going to start with north. As an example, north, 42. 6.5 minutes, west, 89 degrees, 50 minutes. Again, north, 42 degrees, 6.5 minutes, west, 89 degrees, 50 minutes. So how do we do this on the chart? I've edited this chart to kind of give you uh, an example or to give you a little more information let me get my pointer going here. Hold on. Okay, follow the red dot. Um, on your sectional chart, your lines of longitude are going to be depicted in this fashion. They're going to be the main lines that will run through the length of the sectional are going to be identified as the main prime uh, lines of longitude in 10 degree increments. So here we've got the 90 degree line halfway around the earth from the prime meridian. The next line will not necessarily be depicted with the minutes, but 
it's going to be 30 minutes. So you've got 30 minute increments uh, between the depicted long lines on your sectional. Your lines of latitude are the same way. So here you've got the 42 degree line of latitude. The next one above it uh, that is not on the screen will be 42 degrees, 30 minutes. These are not always easy to find on your sectional charts. I chose this picture because I had two of them together. Sometimes you've got to go hunting. Well, I shouldn't say sometimes. You've always got to go hunting around in the clutter for the lines uh, that are labeled, or you've got to go to the edge of the sectional, which isn't always convenient um, when you're in the air trying to figure out what's going on. So I would suggest, highly suggest that you uh, notate your sectionals or, or photocopies uh, of your planned uh, search areas with uh, the basics of the lat longs that you're going to be working on. So here we have the 89, 30 minute line of longitude, the 90, the 90, 30, and the 42. So how do we use these? As you can see, they're divided into 30 minute sections and each tick mark in between is another minute. So 89, 30, 31, 32, 33, and so on until you get to 90. 42 is the same way. So as an example, if we're flying a mission and mission base calls up and says, uh, give us your position, and you happen to be here over the town of Lanark, what you'd do is you would start by figuring out your north, and you'd start with your 42 north line, 42 degrees, one, two, three, four, and as you can see, the clutter can be tough to work with. You may have to go to this side, but you count up until you find where Lanark is in reference to that degree of latitude. And then you bring it across from the west, 89, 1, 2, 3, or you can use the larger lines, which again are hard to find, 89, 30, 40. 50 degrees, and we find that Lenark is at north, 42, six and a half, west, 89, 50. Are there any questions on that? This is a lot easier to do live when I've got you in front of me in a, in a whole chart and we can uh, we can kind of play with it and move it around. So if you have any questions, we'll, we'll get through the presentation and we can hit them a little later on. You may also be called on to do the reverse of that. Uh, you may find yourself uh, being told to proceed to, say, 40, to 6.5 West 89.50. Now you've got to go through and, and plot that all out and find that you are coming to the town of Lenark. This is going to confuse the issue just a little bit because of the age of GPS. Uh, Geocoded map viewers often express North American latitude as a positive number and longitude as a negative number. Um, that's because of the way that the GPS uh, satellites are programmed to see the Earth. Uh, and you may find that uh, you are dealing with a, uh, a partner unit uh, or partner organization uh, or client that is using uh, geocoded map uh, references. So you'll need to be familiar with how to decipher and, and work with those. Any questions on the basics of? finding a position on a sectional chart or any map for that matter that has latitude and longitude depicted in it. Okay. I did have a question. Um, sure. so, for, so if we were looking on a <clears throat> map of the U.S., it would be 
north would be positive and west would be negative? North would be positive and west would, with regard to yeah, a geocoder. So see how when you look at the yes. United States of America, so we would be up in the positive yes. and we would be over in the negative. Correct. So it would be west would be negative and north would be in the positive. Correct. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's see. Now, for your basic qualifications right now, um, you need to know how to depict a point on the chart. You need to know how to find your position and be able to translate it. Uh, there is also a method to determine your course and heading. And incidentally, when we are talking about uh, magnetic and true uh, north, this little symbol on your sectional is how this area, and this happens to be an area just west of Chicago, um, southwest of Chicago, our variation from true north and magnetic north is very slight. Right now it's it's two degrees. And it actually has changed a bit. When I was learning to fly, it was more like one degree. So that magnetic north kind of wanders a little bit. But this is a number that the pilot's going to plug into his calculations if he is trying to, to dead reckon a, uh, a direction. With GPS now, we don't mess with this much uh, anymore. However, you do need to know about it, especially if you end up operating with a compass alone. Uh, this is the line of variation that you would have. So if you pointed your compass to north, you would need to correct it two degrees to the west. I'm sorry, two degrees to the east in order to track to true north. We have a two degree west line of variation. Okay. Let's talk about these sectional charts a little bit more. I'm sorry. Um, can I can I just ask one question? Absolutely. So the two degree uh, variance is that for everywhere in the United States, or because you said Chicago, but is that everywhere? It's going to be different. That's why it's important to know how to find these depictions on your chart. It's okay. going to change as you move uh, uh, move through the Earth. Okay, so it's important to change charts over time, I guess. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this isn't going to be a huge deal over the life of, uh, you know, if you're saying, is it is it going to be different next week? Um, not so much. I learned to fly 30 years ago. Uh, so 30 years ago, we had about a one degree change in, uh, in variation. Okay. Now, if you are, the, the charts, which we're about to talk about, um, are different for each region that you're working in. They're broken down into different regions. So let's say you get out west a little further, your lines of variation are going to be considerably different. Okay. Okay. All right. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yep. I like the question. Thank you. The sectional aeronautical charts, they are one to 500,000 scale. So they are not tremendously detailed. Uh, we get most of our details on the sectionals from the depictions and the legend information uh, for uh, features on the ground. Um, they are used for medium to slow speed aircraft. And the types of information are legend information, which is features, um, aeronautical, which uh, depicts uh, depictions of um, airspace, uh, routes. Uh, and then there's some topographical, which uh, we don't we use uh, the lines uh, like you would see in a regular tote map and colors. Again, uh, as a flatlander, most of our sectionals are green uh, and typically dark green. And that's the most topo information we get. Um, and I would recommend that you download, whether you're a pilot or not, uh, and even if you are a pilot, it's always good to have around a free copy of the FAA Aeronautical Chart User's Guide. This is going to uh, always be a good resource for uh, things, you know, I'll look at a chart and there's there's stuff that uh, I'm always learning and, oh, I didn't know they depicted that. Oh, I didn't know they saw it that way. So download that if you get a chance. 
So your test on Friday is an open book test. Having a sectional legend available would probably be a good idea. Um, again, this is this is not something you're going to memorize. Uh, like I had just mentioned, I'm always finding something neat. You know, they add things sometimes to these legends and things that they put on the map. But this is your basic index. This tells you what these symbols and signs mean on the map. And they're usually very good about explaining what you are looking at, including uh, limitations to the depiction. Uh, for example, uh, let's see here. I had one. You know, this will tell you that a tower is under construction, which may mean there's no light on top of it. Uh, it really can get some detail crammed into these little symbols. And each little symbol uh, has detail of its own, um, you know, using dots and different sizes. So get to know the legend. This is our primary source of navigation and information as an air crew. The back of the legend uh, is going to have uh, gra uh, not char uh, graphs, but um, charts of airspace and times of their fr use, frequencies that they're using, uh, all things that the pilot primarily is going to worry about, the observer on a secondary level. But as a scanner, I'm going to say that most of you are probably aspiring to get into the observer spot as well, or uh, some of you may be pilots who are uh, doing your uh, your scanner training as your, your prereq as emergency services in, uh, in hopes of becoming a mission pilot. Irregardless, whoever you are, uh, start to uh, know how to find information on airspace so that you can advise and at a professional level as a scanner be up to speed on the areas that you may be flying in. This is a picture of a sectional, a section of a sectional. Uh, it depicts a lot of information from airports. And all of these little depictions, and we've got uncontrolled airports, which are usually in magenta, which are in magenta. You've got private airports that are usually uh, non-public entities, and they are listed as restricted. Um, you can make a phone call and maybe get in and out of one. You've got controlled airports, which have a control tower. We've got navigation aids. This in is a VOR, this is the VOR off of DuPage, and the navigation aids is easy to spot because they have a large compass rose associated with them. One thing I wanna draw your attention to is this weird looking number here, one four. This is called the maximum elevation figure, or MEF. If you remember anything as a scanner, this is the number that's going to help you out the most as a flight crew member because this is the number that tells you the highest point in a sectional quadrant here. These are all based on these uh, 15, 15 degree, uh, let's see, 10, one, two, three, four, yeah, 15 degree quadrants. Each 15 degree quadrant is going to have a number like this in it. You can see one four here in this quadrant. It happens to be one six. They try and put them closest to the highest obstacle in or terrain in the sectional. So, for example, if you are being asked to run a search in this area here, you can quickly look at your chart and know that you've got to be at least above 1,400 feet. MSL to be safe. And that's the number on your altimeter. What this number is, is the highest obstacle, which uh, in this case is this 1,176 uh, foot tower, plus, uh, I'm mincing my words, it's a 295 foot tower, plus your uh, elevation of the ground makes it an object that is 1176 feet above mean sea level that can't be our highest item in the in the quad this is our highest item in the quad 
So disregard. They're throwing these wherever they want. They're throwing them where you can see them the best. Know that this is the highest op or the highest altitude that you've got to worry about in the quad. Stay above it. And I'll kind of terminate that disaster of explanation. Um, we talked about navigation aids that are depicted. I have a quick question. Airport. Yeah, go ahead. Right there above your pointer is the private airport rudder. What yes. is the 852-22? What does that represent? Okay, 852 is the height of the uh, uh, airport in mean sea level. So it resides at 852 feet. And the dash 22, I believe, is it's a 2,200-foot runway, but I don't know. So let's take a look. And if any of the pilots out, if any of the pilots out there can refresh my memory, go ahead. Uh, Steve, this is Mike. Yeah. Th that's correct. The first number is the elevation of the airport, and the second number is the runway length and hundreds of feet. Runway length and hundreds of feet. And this airport happens to be a grass uh, airport, even though it's uh, restricted private. Um, these circles mean that they are grass airports. Here's one down here. That's Hinkley. There is no runway drawn on it. Hinkley is a grass airport, and they just depict that with a circle. You notice there's no R in here. This is a public airport uh, that is grass. These are hard surfaces if you see a runway drawing in them. Thank you. Good question. Thank you. That got my brain cells rubbing that, together, too. That figure yeah. is the longest runway at that airport, not yeah. all of them. Absolutely. That is correct. So let's go to DeKalb. DeKalb, they did their best to show us two runways. One is obviously longer than the other. Um, this airport is at 913 feet MSL. 7,000 feet is the longest runway. Um, and while we're on the subject, when you get to these bigger public airports, you will find a lot more information depicted next to them, like the name of the airport, the three-letter identifier. AWOS 3 is the weather information that they have broadcasting, and this is the frequency that they broadcast it on. Um, here's the frequency that is the common traffic frequency. This is a non-control towered airport, hence its magenta color. We slide over here to Rochelle. You can see that this also, by depiction, is a hard surface runway, uncontrolled because it's magenta. But because of its size, does not warrant the pretty picture like this. Its runway length leaves it in this fashion. DuPage Airport over here. This is a controlled airport in blue. Again, more information to the side. And uh, we've got plenty to go through. Uh, folks, just uh, get your charts out when you can and start to get a feel for these things. Uh, today's exercise as a scanner is, uh, is basic introduction to some of the things you're going to find on the chart. Through practice, you're going to get more proficient at what you can decipher from these things. Airspace is the last thing I need to talk about on this slide. Uh, you have... Big class B airspace, and airspace is depicted in letter classes, A, B, C, D, E, and G. Um, what those are and their, uh, their spaces and their dimensions, you can find uh, in your uh, on the chart. You can also find them in uh, your text guide. Controlled airspace is always going to be in blue. In this case here, we've got a blue dashed line around this airport, and it is a uh, Class D airspace, which is just a control tower. Same thing with Powaukee. The solid blue lines indicate a larger airspace. This is Class B airspace. There's a lot more that goes into getting in and out of this airspace and the communication requirements. And that Class B where you were, was started at 4,000 all the way up to 10,000, correct? That's correct. This particular section is 4,000 up to 10,000. And it looks kind of like a wedding cake. Uh, folks, there's so much to, to pick out of a sectional chart. 
Fortunately, as a scanner, um, the expectation is uh, rudimentary knowledge, uh, but absolutely uh, when you get an opportunity, start looking at these things because as a good crew member, the more knowledge you have, the better off you're gonna be. This particular airspace is cut into many slices and gives you a lot of op options to uh, maneuver. For example, as you had mentioned, the bottom of this layer starts at 4,000 feet to accommodate the DuPage airport's traffic coming in and out because this airspace, and I can't move the slide over, this is a snapshot, this airspace is centered around Chicago O'Hare. So if you were to look at this from a side view, it would look like an upside down wedding cake with different levels. And if you were to start at the bottom, it would go up and out and up and out. And this is a shelf and then a ceiling. In addition to airport airspaces, and uh, while we were talking about it, this is a class D airspace, which is a tower controlled airspace. It starts from the ground and goes up to 3,200 feet. So you could fly over it if you were above 3,200 feet and not have to talk to the control tower. You can fly through it and talk to the control tower or you can go around it. This slide is uh, depicting um, special use airspace, uh, primarily restricted area airspace and military training routes. And you can see the uh, dramatic pattern that we use to define these boundaries. Restricted area airspace is exactly that. Do not enter without prior permission from the controlling agency. Typically, restricted airspace is going to be a military operation airspace, and that all that does not always mean uh, aircraft operation. It could be an artillery range. It could be a parachute drop area. Um, so if you see the big blue R uh, and your pilot is uh, gabbing with the mission observer and you're pointed right at it and you're on your way in, uh, absolutely let them know because the crew is responsible for all of its operations. Um, below that, well, we'll get into this on the next slide, so let's not talk about uh, the, the magenta ones just yet. What I wanted to show you here was these lines, which are military training routes. In this case, this is an instrument route depicted by IR, which means these pilots are moving, uh, are flying under instrument conditions, uh, possibly training, which means they are purposely not looking outside. Now, somebody for safety is going to be looking outside, but uh, you can expect this crew to be concentrating on their instruments and flying in. This particular line, VR, 1697, that's the identifier of the line, uh, training route is a visual route. So these guys are looking outside, but irregardless, um, these crews tend to be very busy. They're usually on some kind of operation training, uh, high tempo. So do not expect them to be looking out for you. They are in the middle of a job. And uh, even though our first requirement as an aviator is to look out for other traffic, uh, we all know that uh, human error, uh, you're focusing on what you're trying to do. Uh, they, they are not watching for you necessarily. You need to be watching for them. Hence the reason we put these routes on the chart so that everybody is aware that there's something special going on in, in this area. So restricted uh, training routes, restricted areas you cannot go into without prior permission. You can cross these and fly along them all day long. Just do them at your own peril. These are not restricted. They're just warning areas. That back side of the uh, sectional that I talked about, this is where you will find um, information on restricted and prohibited areas, time of operation, altitudes, et cetera. And this is the one that gets talked about and debated a whole lot. It's the military operations area. And don't let the term military operations think, cause you to think that is a restricted area. It is not. It is a warning area letting you know that the military has blocked this airspace for something, some form of training. A lot of times it's, uh, it's uh, an area of uh, refueling tanker tracks. Um, you generally 
don't know what's going on unless you've observed it, been around, talked to the controllers. But uh, this is a military operation area. The caution with this is, just like with those lines of training or those, those uh, training routes, uh, military operations area are exactly that. They've got some fancy equipment moving around in there and a high tempo operation, either training, practicing, fighting, dog fighting, uh, you name it, they may be doing it. And it's an area of extreme caution and uh, elevated vigilance, but not restricted to operations. Once again, referencing the, uh, the legend, you're going to find the information on the MOAs there. Okay, once again, this is advisory. So if you are planning an op, if you've got a search going on in this quadrant, you can find out if the military is going to be a, uh, a factor in, uh, in your operation. Uh, and the crew should all be aware if they're operating in, in such a space. They're going to be labeled with a name. Use your legend to, to, uh, to gather the information on them. Determining position. So now we've gone from looking at the chart, the, the different depictions to knowing where you're at. As a scanner, uh, your primary role is to keep eyes on the ground. Um, part of your secondary roles, as we discussed, is to aid in keeping the log and knowing where you're at. As the person looking on the ground, you're going to want to start to develop the technique of kind of keeping your finger on your sectional. And one thing I didn't mention, because I've been at this for a long time as a flyer, and GPS and all the tablets and stuff uh, have caused me to have to learn some new stuff. If you've got a tablet, and uh, you know I've flown with mission scanners and observers who had more equipment than I had in my jets when I was flying. Um, you're going to have an easier time of, of maintaining position on uh, or position information with your tablets, but always keep a paper sectional handy. And if you don't have tablets, if you haven't invested in that type of technology uh, and you are using paper, develop the technique of keeping your finger on that sectional and tracking where you are based on uh, your observations on the ground. What you want to do is you want to work from smaller to larger. So in this case, you've got this airplane here, and uh, you're trying to determine, you're ver trying to verify where you think your position is. So you look out the window, and you find the biggest thing you can find. And in this case, it happens to be a lake. But let's say there's three or four lakes around here. Uh, so you identify, I think we're near, you know, a lake such and such. Now you start to work yourself down into smaller features. Well, what else is near lake such and such? Oh, there's a cell phone tower that should be off to my left. Boom, you identify the cell phone tower. Now you got a pretty good idea that you are in this, this zone on your sectional. But a general rule of thumb is to try and group three objects together to be absolutely certain of your position. And, and in this case, you can use a nearby airport. You can use reference to position on a road. You can use railroad tracks, um, but try and piece together multiple features on the ground that are depicted on your sectional to get an accurate confirmation of where your position is. Um, tracking and recording position. Again, as I mentioned, that's your secondary uh, secondary job is to know where you're at. Uh, you should try and maintain positional awareness from the takeoff to the landing. Keep your finger on the map. Method is, is uh, preferred using visual landmarks. Uh, and I, you know what? I'm going to take that back. Preferred is if you can get a tablet that tracks these things for you, you'd be in really good shape. You can ask the pilot and the observer to determine position by using the, v the GPS up front. Uh, once you've located a downed aircraft, you've been given the tools to determine its location through Latin long uh, on your charts. And the only way you're going to be able to do that is if you've been tracking where your position is all along, or you're going to have to go to the crutch and have the, uh, the guys in the front hit the GPS and tell you where you're at. Um, the details on the sectional chart are often not detailed enough 
to be useful, especially in wide open spaces for ground units. Um, so you may also have to transfer that information to a uh, another type of map. And I remember I, we talked about this way uh, in the beginning. You may need to use a road map. You may need to go to the gas station before you take off and get something that you can use to translate to the uh, ground team. Also, the recommendation is that as a professional scanner, somebody who is good at their craft, you will have invested in a gazetteer for the state that you're typically going to operate in. Knowing the aircraft's position at all times is essential, uh, especially uh, if you have the unfortunate uh, occurrence of an in-flight emergency. Um, you're going to want to be able to broadcast stuff quickly uh, and get information out so that uh, your recovery is that much uh, more insured. Uh, there's a question in the chat. Um, it says, "What are about? Let's say, what about TRSAs? TSAs uh, or T yeah. says TRSAs? TRSAs. Uh, whoever put that in, could you voice it? Oh, temporary, temporary radar. See, Tur temporary radar service areas. Tursas, uh Rockford is a TERSA. Um, a temporary radar service area is, uh, let's see if we can find one here. A TERSA is, uh, Rockford is an example of a TERSA. Uh, a TERSA goes back to a classification that we used to have. We used to have ARSAs, TERSAs. Um, a TERSA is a, uh, a radar area that uh, isn't, is optional, okay? You can go in and out of a TERSA um, because they're providing radar service due to volume of traffic that they have, but the the um, the governing airspace is typically a class D airspace that the TERSA is built around. TERSA is kind of a, of a, uh, uh, a less potent Class C airspace. Uh, Steve, can I make a comment? This is Mike. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, just uh, basically, just in, uh, in relation to what you said, a lot of Tursas are airports that were originally Class C airports, and then had uh, insufficient traffic to you know warrant them continuing to be Class Cs. But the radar equipment in that is still there. So you're allowed to make, you know, able to make use of it. But a lot of them are downgraded class C airports. That, that's the only comment I'm going to make. No, that, that is correct. You, you do not see a whole lot of TERSAs uh, operational right now because the, you know, they were downgraded class Cs. Somebody's got to fund them. Uh, so, but we have, uh, you know, for training purposes, we have the luxury of having Rockford as a TERSA in our, in our area. Um, Another method for reporting position, and I'm going to speed up here because Mike's still got to get some stuff in, is the CAP grid system. Uh, before I get too far along with this, get an old sectional as part of your kit for the regions that you're going to be operating in and hand grid them so that you always have a gridded sectional available. You can use an old sectional for CAP grids and for reference. You just don't want to use them for navigation because they don't keep up with the changes. But an old sectional with a grid system is, is going to be beneficial. Uh, they are divided into 15-minute uh, blocks of latitude and longitude. And then you can divide them into subgrids. So we're going to blaze through this a little bit here. Um, each grid is 15 by 15. This is all uh, spelled out quite clearly in your reference text. So please take a look at it. Um, this grid happens to be the St. Louis 5. And as you can see, it's a 15 by 15 section. And these are lines of latitude and longitude. And the grid here is uh, the St. Louis 5. Um, and if you want to break that down even further, you can say, let's say you're here. You can say, I'm in the St. Louis 5 uh, alpha. So now your IC knows that you are up in this area on a sectional. And I'm going to put this on a sectional here in a second here. You get a better view. The thing about the grid system is that it can be broken down one more time into a smaller section. So, for example, in this one, you would be in, let's say it's the, the St. Louis 5 again. Uh, and your IC says, your Air, Air Branch Director says, proceed to cap grid 
uh, St. Louis five uh, alpha alpha. So what they've section alpha alpha. So what they've done is they've taken this cap grid. This would have been section alpha. They broke it down further into another quadrant of seven and a half degrees by seven and a half degrees uh, for easy reference, quick reference of location and position. Not as detailed as Latin long, but it'll get you in the ballpark, especially if you're in an emergency and all you've got is, okay, we, we knew we were in cap grid alpha alpha, uh, St. Louis five. So you could make a quick radio call, look for us in cap grid, uh, St. Louis five alpha alpha. This is what it looks like on your sectional chart. Um, the red lines, this was done with uh, a, uh, this was done with uh, flightplan.com, which is what I use. It's free. It's the, it's the same information that you get in ForeFlight. Uh, not as, uh, not as slick as ForeFlight, but I've uh, enjoyed using it, especially since it's free. Uh, you can put cap grids on there. And here you see ORD uh sectional which is chicago so you've got your name of the grid you've got your number and if you can see the little letters that kind of help you out and as i mentioned before you can break this down one more time into four more quadrants i know i'm moving through this very quickly but i think i ex matter of fact i know once you sit down to grid your own sectional Using the uh, information in your reference text, you'll get it. You'll understand. Um, one more time, if I was coming down here, let's say I was sent down to this area uh, above La Rose, this would be cap grid 367 delta. And if I wanted to break it down even more, it'd be cap 367 delta delta. I know I'm moving quick. Um, does anybody have any questions on this right now? Yes, that first example you got, um, if you go back two slides, when you divide a subgrid down, it's not alpha, alpha, bravo, bravo. It's like alpha, bravo and alpha, charlie, alpha, delta, isn't it? That is correct. I'm sorry. You, you, are, you are correct. This would be, uh, well, this would be delta, delta. This would be delta, bravo. This would be delta, alpha. Uh, they okay. did not draw that right. This should be alpha, uh, bravo. alpha, bravo. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're right. Okay, thank you. Oh, thanks. Thanks for catching that. I, I didn't even notice that when I grabbed the slide. Oh, to slow down and catch that point. We're coming in here, for example, this would be Alpha Bravo. I'm sorry, Alpha Alpha, Alpha Bravo, Alpha Charlie, Alpha Delta. Charlie Alpha, Charlie Bravo. Charlie, Charlie, Charlie Delta. Thanks again. Should have done it on this one. It's a little easier to see. Once again, this is just reiterating the fact that if you want to use, you can use a new sectional. Uh, just know that once it uh, expires, uh, that uh, it shouldn't be used for navigation anymore unless you're really desperate. Um, and have lost uh, all your other forms of navigation. It's not a huge deal if your sectional is not too far out of date, but uh, keep them around. It should be in your kit. Use a highlighter uh, to mark the grids. Don't use pink because pink is a, a color that uh, is close to the magenta and the colors on the sectional. It doesn't show up very well. Use an orange or a dark or a blue. Uh, and uh, grid out your sectionals. It'll be something that you, uh, it's almost like a badge of honor. You got your gridded sectional, then, uh, then you're ready to go. Any more questions on that? The last thing I'm gonna touch on here before we let uh, Lieutenant Citadino get in the game is uh, crew resource management. Crew resource management is a concept that uh, was developed in the airlines. The military has picked it up. It's transferred down to uh, corporate flying and, uh, and operations where you are using a crew. Um, basically, it's divisional labor. It's learning to work together. It's learning to, uh, to, both, or to take tasks uh, on to uh, make your crew more efficient and much more safe. Uh, the best ways to um, accomplish crew resource management 
is to train and to practice and to know your job. Uh, just like the, uh, uh, the, the, the title describes, you're a crew, you have a lot of resources collectively, and you need to learn to manage your talents, your time, and your, your positions to better serve the operation. Compared to general aviation operators per 1,000 flight hours, this is just a chart that kind of shows the benefit of, uh, of uh, CAP's use of crew resource management as a rule. Um, our incident and accident rates are much lower than the average uh, general aviation uh, rates over, over time because the crews are working together and nobody is taking on more than uh, than necessary to safely get through a flight. Again, this is just another uh, chart that depicts uh, the um, positive results of crew resource management. Crew resource management is going to help you with what we call situational awareness. Because you are spreading the load and no one crew member is overloaded, um, it allows you to focus. And in order to maintain good situational awareness, you need to be focused. You need to be in good mental health, low stress as possible, good physical health. You need to be attentive and you need to ask questions. You need to be inquisitive. All these things come together so that you know what's going around on around you in situational awareness. It prevents task saturation. And as I just said, you know, you don't want to be overloaded. You don't want to have one person carrying the load. You don't want the pilot to be worrying about uh, ground scanning, to be worrying about um, communicating with the FM radio uh, to a mission base if you've got an observer who can handle that. Uh, you as a scanner, it, the more skills you can pick up, the more tasks you can take on to help prevent task saturation. Uh, so if you can learn to use that FM radio, uh, you can maybe take some load off of the observer who is now juggling several balls through, uh, through the course of a mission and say, hey, let me have the FM radio control. Uh, you tune it and I'll run it from the back seat. Um, try to recognize where you can pitch in and maybe uh, assist in taking some of the load. Pilots and aircrew must realize that you can't have complete situational awareness all the time. The key is to have a plan to recover when things start to fall apart. So if your tempo goes up and everybody's busy and you've got to find and now everybody's really keyed up and moving and you start to notice, hey, wait a minute, you know, we're dropping below that 500 foot minimum altitude or, you know, you're at a bank angle just to keep your eyes on this thing that is starting to approach 45 degrees. Uh, you as a crew member need to maintain your situational awareness. And when that feeling goes off in your head, you need to say something like knock it off or time out or abort, or quite frankly, this is stupid. We need to stop. Uh, that will get everybody's attention and it will recalibrate all crew members back towards center on situational awareness. Another thing you need to do in crew resource management is to recognize when a sterile cockpit is required. And if you remember back a few slides or a few lessons, sterile cockpit is limit the talk to a minimum uh, in high tempo, high volume areas, high uh, uh, critical flight regimes, takeoff, landing, departure. Um, if you're in the grid and there's a another aircraft entering the grid and you're wanting to tell the pilot, okay, it's time to turn or it's time to do something else. And uh, that pilot is focusing on avoiding the traffic. It's time to initiate sterile cockpit and minimize chatter so that the immediate threat can be handled. Assignment of duties uh, in an effort to promote crew resource management, CAP 60-3, uh, starts to outline the duties. For example, we talked about this in the beginning of the, of the course. The aircraft commander is the pilot in command or the bus driver. Uh, that's the pilot. 
The mission commander oftentimes is the mission observer. We're dividing our labor. The pilot's going to worry about getting you to and from and in the area safely. The mission commander is primary responsibility is the deliverables, getting the mission uh, portion accomplished in conjunction with the pilot and utilizing the scanners to take off, to take the, uh, the operational load of, of scanning the ground. Understand and execute your assignments. Uh, the primary role of the mission scanner, as we keep discussing, is eyes on the ground. Understand what your role is. If your role is not to do one thing, don't jump in and do it if the other person has it under control. Um, know your position. Know what your responsibilities are. Communicate. Communicate when you see something that's not working out, like knock it off. Communicate when you uh, uh, have to pass information. Talk, 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 talk. When it is a good opportunity, you can't communicate enough. And question when you don't think or you don't understand or something doesn't seem right or you just have to know some, uh, have, have to know what's going on. Situational awareness and crew resource management begins with the briefing. Play close attention to all briefings. Uh, you are increasing a workload if you are not paying attention to vital points in a briefing and the pilot of the, or the observer have to explain things that were clear in a briefing uh, more often than is warranted. Understanding the big picture comes from the briefing. Uh, a lot of times, though, you're going to find that uh, uh, an incident may be a, a run-and-gun situation and you may not get the briefing that you had hoped for. So now you've got to ask questions in order to understand the big picture and bring better situational awareness to your, to your operation. Watch for task overload in yourself and other crew members. I had mentioned, you know, you taking load from other crew members, but, uh, you know, if that um, mission observer is comfortable with your skills and says, okay, can you handle this radio? Hey, can you keep the log? Can you do this? Can you do that? You need to, you need to know what your limits are. And uh, there's, there's nothing wrong with saying, that's not on me right now. I can't handle that. Uh, or we'll have to table that for something else. Uh, again, don't be afraid to ask questions. Use the codes, knock it off, time out, abort, or this is stupid. If, if we need to level wings, climb out and recalibrate. That was pretty fast. But uh, the good news is crew resource management is a concept. It's a culture. It's not on your test. Uh, it's something you're going to hear about all the time. And again, I think the best word for me to use for that is, is a culture. We are all working together towards a safe and positive end to all of our flying uh, activities. Are there any questions on that? Okay, if, if there's no questions, uh, I'm going to uh, take the, over the presentation now. Um, uh, did I turn it off, Mike? I think I killed it. No, I, I've already taken it, yes. Okay, good. all right, you got it. And please start entering the information into the chat. I was kind of behind on that. My, it was my fault. It's kind of okay. <laughs> so. Okay, we're going to move forward here, and uh, we're going to backtrack a little bit. Now we're going to be covering chapters nine and ten. Uh, we're starting off with chapter nine, which is search, planning, and coverage. And the objectives of this chapter is to define some search terms that you'll deal with uh, while we're on missions. And planning and we're also going to cover a couple other things we're going to talk about basically disaster assessment and what are some of the things that we want to cover during disaster assessment questions we want to ask things we want to look for and we're also going to follow that up with some uh people search we're going to look at both disaster assessment and uh Person search. So we'll move forward. But this, this is going to cover these two tasks. 
So we're going to start off with some search terms. First, we have some fair terms regarding to the likelihood that we're going to search or how we're going to search. Maximum area of possibility. This is a basically typically a circular area that defines the likely area in which an objective is expected to be found. This is based on a variety of factors. It's an important search term for human search, ground search. It depends on, you know, the type of the target, the type of the terrain, the movement speed of the target, how long it's been since the target was spotted or last known to be. And, uh, you know, based on those factors, they determine pretty much what type of, what's the range of area that something can cover in that period of time between the last time it was spotted and the time of the search. Somewhat narrower than that, we have the probability area. And this is within the area of possibility, the area where we most reasonably expect that we're going to find the target. So um, for an aircraft, it uh, could be um, something where we know an aircraft might have a certain possible range, but we have some reason to estimate that maybe the aircraft was uh, limited on fuel and so likely couldn't get to the full extent of the range. The range might be an area of possibility. The probability area might be restricted by how much fuel we might know the aircraft to have on board. For people, this is similar depending upon how well they can travel and what the likelihood of being able to survive conditions are. And these two things kind of combine to give us a probability of detection. Um, basically, the probability of detection is the likelihood that we're going to be able to locate an objective. And again, this applies both to ground search as well as to air search. And it is basically things like the type of target, the behavior of the target, what are the conditions, what is the terrain. All of these have impact on how likely we are going to be able to, to get to our target. Um, Lieutenant uh, Gulaga had mentioned about our probability of detection being relatively low. <laughs> and you can find a chart with a probability detection chart or table that's in the pilot and observer reference manual. And if you look at that, you'll see that our probability detection, which is dependent upon what is the search visibility. And remember, the search visibility is how well we're liable to see or how far we can see out of the aircraft, which impacts our scanning range, which is how far out of the aircraft we actually can expect to find something, and the altitude of the aircraft and the terrain. And our probability of detection, let's assume 1,000 feet with a one-mile search track, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later, can be anywhere from 25 to 60 percent in an open area, a flat open area, depending upon our, our stretch altitude, down to as little as 5 to 20 percent in a, what would be a heavily wooded area or a forested area. So there's a lot of factors that affect the probability of detection. So ground track is another term, and it is an imaginary line on the ground that's, that follows the aircraft's physical flight through the air or physical line of flight through the air. And ground track is important because it gives us a reference um, to where we're going to be looking for. And we'll talk about ground track a little bit more, and we'll see how it also plays into our search patterns in the next chapter. The search track is an area along the ground that's formed by the scanning range and the aircraft's ground track. So typically what we're doing, if you remember from the previous uh, week on scanning and scanning technique, we have a scanning range, which is an offset, lateral offset from the, from the position of the aircraft to the ground that you as a scanner can expect to see a target. So our search track is basically the offset from that ground track, that imaginary ground track, to where the aircraft is going to be flying, what the aircraft's offset from the ground track is with, within a specified scanning range. And finally, we have track spacing. Now, when we fly search, 
we fly several different search patterns that chapter 10 is going to cover. Several of those are searches in rectangular areas that follow grid patterns. And even when we do a search over a route of flight, we have what we call a track spacing, which is basically the difference between adjacent legs that, uh, of search. Usually the track spacing is determined by the search, uh, excuse me, by the scanning range for a given set of conditions when the search is occurring. And finally, we have some more search terms related to how we see things. To begin with, we have a term called meteorological visibility. Um, this says it's the maximum range in which large objects can be seen. It's basically what is the range that you can actually see things, let's say, looking out of the aircraft. If you get a me tire, you get a weather briefing, you might have, what's your visibility? 10 statute miles. That's basically about how far you can expect to see and uh, and determine objects outside of the aircraft before meteorological conditions, atmospheric conditions, are going to start to make things unrecognizable to you. Then we have search visibility, which we had discussed before, which is basically how far out of the aircraft can we see something and still be able to recognize it. If you remember for CAP, that's typically how far out of the aircraft at 1,000 feet can we expect to see and recognize the vehicle on the ground. Scanning range is, again, that lateral distance from the aircraft, which we expect that you as a scanner is not only going to be able to see something, it's going to be able to see something and be able to identify it uh, rather uh, def definitely. And then finally, we have search altitude, which is the altitude of the aircraft above the ground. And remember that the search altitude is a factor in your scanning range, that you're basically forming a triangle based on the angle of your view from the aircraft to the ground and the altitude of the aircraft from the ground. And that's going to be determining, that will well determine what your scanning range is, the combination of those two. So we're talking here about disaster assessment and we're also talking about disaster relief. Those are big areas for CAP in terms of missions. In fact, over the years now, as the technology has moved from the older 121, uh, 236 uh, ELTs, which are still in service, but are being more and more largely replaced by the 406. The older 121s, uh, 236s, did not have location information in the radio signal. It was just an omnidirectional radio signal. And it required basically triangulation, either from the ground or in the air, in order to determine where the signal was located. That was an important reason for CAP to do searches for lost aircraft. 406 now, which does include GPS encoded location data, has largely reduced the requirement for those types of searches in order to find uh, a lost aircraft or even a lost person with a PLB, or, uh, which is basically also GPS enabled. And as such, our participation in disaster relief, disaster assessment has grown as becoming one of the major things that CAP does in terms of missions. We participate in a lot of these. We participate in things like uh, Hurricane Sandy, Katrina, doing a damage assessment. Here in Illinois, we do a lot of damage ass assessment related to, tornado, uh, to tornadoes, related to flooding, where, we, where, where we're called out quite often to do that by local agencies. So when we're doing this, we are still offering search and rescue as needed, but the bulk of our, our disaster stuff is going to be related to air reconnaissance in the form of aerial photography. We'll take pictures of damages, we'll take pictures of what's going on so that the responding agencies can see what the what is literally the picture, what they can see, what's going on, what sort of what's happening on the ground, what do things look like, so that helps them to plan their, their response. Transportation and courier flights are also important to us. We will bring supplies in possibly. Also, we transport people around as needed. And finally, because CAP's got a rather robust radio uh, infrastructure, we can, if necessary, provide 
communication support instances where the local communication infrastructure may be disrupted. So of course, all these operations, anything CAP does may be impacted by the disaster it is we're trying to uh, assess or respond to. Uh, Weather-related disasters, if the weather is still going on, it may make flight operations difficult or even impossible. Damage to infrastructure may impact our ability to uh, respond. And in, in some cases, if we actually had some form of biological chemical accidents that, that, that disperses over a wide area, the requirement to address that in terms of protect, protective gear or danger of entering areas may also have an impact on our ability to respond. So what is it that we want to do, or what are we looking for, or what are the things that we are interested in if we're going to do assessment missions? So here you have, in, in, in regards to the test coming up, here you have a nice list of what sort of questions should we be asking. And you know, basically what we want to do is look to see what the extent of the damage is, how does the damage affect people who might need rescue, how does the damage affect infrastructure, which might be made inaccessible or need repair? How does the damage affect property that also might need repair and might affect um, the ability of people to, to live or to continue normal uh, operate, uh, life in a certain area? So those are the three big things that we want to ask questions about and cover. So what are we looking for? Well, mostly we're looking for two things. In my opinion, I say we're looking for two things. We're concerned about people and we're concerned about infrastructure. We want to make sure that we can identify people who might need support, might need rescue, might need assistance of some kind, might be isolated by flooding or something like that. And we also need to understand what's happened to the infrastructure. Are there power lines that are down? Are there roads that are blocked? Are there things that are going to impact the ability of the local agencies and the responders to be able to do their job of responding? So those are the sort of things that's important for us to be able to assess. We do that both uh, potentially on the ground as well as in the air. Um, this is the scanning class we're talking about it from the standpoint of the air. But we also might also on the ground be called in to do damage assessment and, uh, and review uh, on the ground after something happens. So what are the, some of the things we want to know or we want to be able to report that, that the uh, responding agencies that we're reporting to are, are interested in? Well, they want to know where that is. So we're going to do latitude and longitude. And actually, this type of stuff that we're talking about from the air, most of what we're interested in is aerial photography. We're all GPS enabled when it comes to the photography. So this is largely going to be covered. However, assuming that you were on a mission where you were doing visual examination and you didn't have a photographer, then you're going to want to record manually things like a latitude and longitude, some description of what it is you're looking at, with, you know, what the, the extent of the damage is to report back to the agencies. So we're going to look at now a couple of sets of slides. First thing we're going to look at are some slides of the World Trade Center uh, damage. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time with these. I'm just going to kind of walk through them fairly quickly. I do will point out, though, that CAP was number one on the scene. It was a CAP aircraft that was the first aircraft after World after 9-11 to be com uh, commissioned to actually overfly that area and take damage assessment photographs. And the one thing about this is you'll see that we're taking pictures of this from different angles and that. And part of that is important when we're looking to assess damage. We want to cover as much as, as we can, look at things from different perspectives. That's going to show things that might be hidden in one, area, one perspective but will be available in another.
And so next we're going to move on from this to some photographs of what it's more likely we are going to see. You know, World Trade Center was an exceptional event, but mostly what we're going to respond to are naturally disasters, mostly weather disasters, in, in, like in Illinois, in the form of flooding and tornadoes. So here's a picture of some flooding. And that's actually something that we wind up doing assessment for quite frequently. Similar to the last picture, here's a case of some flooding where we've got some damage behind a levee. Here's obviously some flooding. We've got a levee. This, this road here that looks pretty well intact, but there's evidence here that there's some water leaking through this, this structure underneath, or maybe it flowed over and now it's receded. Here's infrastructure that's been impacted by a natural disaster. In this case, obviously, this expressway or this road looks to be intact, but the egress to it is totally blocked due to the flooding. Here's a road that's not intact, or in this case, a bridge that's not intact. Tornadoes. More tornado damage. More tornado damage. So if we didn't have a photograph here, we might want to say this is a subdivision of some kind. It's located, centered around some Latin long, and you would report that all the structures have been, uh, have been destroyed by the tornadoes and there's only slabs left. More tornado damage. Don't know really if this truck was in the garage and got tossed around or got tossed into the garage and was maybe a half mile away, depending upon the strength of the tornado. Here we have a refinery damage. Looks like there probably was a fire here. You can still see, looks like some spray coming out from a fire hose. Besides infrastructure and physical damage, accidents are something that we may actually be called out to investigate. And we're going to have a few here of uh, train wrecks. This one's in infrared of a trains on cars that have been crashed and tank cars that are on fire. And here's a visual of a train crash or train wreck with some cars on fire. So that's simply an idea of what sort of things that when we do damage assessment and damage, um, in this case, uh, damage assessment, that we're actually out there looking at. And what I see mostly in the tornadoes and the flooding are things that we actually go out and assess quite often here in Illinois. Lastly, we're gonna talk a little bit about missing person search. Strictly speaking, aerial search is not the ideal way of finding a missing person. Uh, you really are using ground search to find missing people. And there's a variety of reasons for that. It's not easy to see somebody from the air. For the most part, if you're looking for a missing person outside of some sort of accident where there are maybe survivors who are trying to be rescued, you're typically looking for people who are despondent, suffer from some sort of dementia, suffer from some sort of autism. I mean, I'm on a civilian search and rescue team in addition to CAP, and those are almost entirely, when we go out looking, we're looking for somebody in one of those categories. Those are people who aren't particularly looking to be found. And they're not going to behave in a way that makes them obvious to somebody who's looking for them. We do have down here, this is just part of, in any case, when we're looking for somebody, trying to know what they're wearing uh, uh, and as much information as we can about them as something that should be done when we're briefed on, on a search. So now we're going to move into some pictures looking at people or looking for people in, um, from the air. Now, this is actually a pretty good situation to be looking for people. We've got essentially a flat terrain, not a whole lot of vegetation. We do have this ridge or 
like thing going across here that looks like there's a lot of rocky ground. So there's a lot of texture in here that may hide things. But we're looking at something that's largely a best case scenario if you're looking for a person from the air and this in the following slides. So where is the person? What do we look at that might tell us? Well, we've got something down here because it looks like there's a little bit of color there or something that doesn't fit the pattern of the modeling, the pattern of the texture of the ground. And we also have this little stick looking thing here that also doesn't fit. So if we're looking for a person, we're probably looking at this in here to be our, our person. Moving down to 500 feet, we see that that's exactly what we got. Now here we've got a shadow coming off of something that's standing up really from the ground because it's kind of obvious because of the shadow. So definitely this is our person. There was that black line in the other photograph. And here we've got that other thing that we saw with some color in it. From this picture, you can't really tell what it is. Uh, probably some equipment or something we don't really know. But um, this is uh, probably our person. And uh, if we went back and contrasted that to the photographs from last week when we were talking about scanning, uh, you may remember we had a picture of uh, a helicopter crash against a, a, a well jacket. And that was in very similar flat terrain. There were a couple of vehicles there. There was the jackhead there. Even though you couldn't necessarily tell exactly what everything was, it's pretty obvious that something's there. Looking for a person here, it's a lot less obvious to support, to, to see, especially we consider you're in an aircraft flying maybe, this is uh, 90 miles an hour, and this is at 500 feet. And the remainders of these, I think, are at all at 500 feet. We would be looking at 1,000 feet and seeing even less as we go over it, unless we spotted something of interest and came down. So here we have a camo shirt. You'll notice in all these pictures, I'll tell you something as you'll, you'll probably already seen, we're basically looking at the same thing, the same area of ground, the person in about the same location, something out here in front of them that seems to be something else. But you can see even here, the camel shirt does blend in rather a bit more. A thousand feet, this might not really be recognizable as opposed to 500 feet. A yellow shirt. Well, this sticks out pretty well because you've got some color here. And, and something brightly colored is definitely going to stick out of this here, which is mostly grays and whites, pretty mono, monochrome uh, terrain. So, so that might help the search. Here's a blue shirt. That also sticks out pretty well. And again, here we've got a shadow coming off of this person, which helps. One of the things is, when we fly, being able sometimes to cover things from different perspectives aids our, again, aids our ability to scan and to spot things because something that's not obvious from one perspective may become more obvious or recognizable from another. Here's an orange shirt that's kind of reddish in the picture, but again, becomes much easier and better to spot somebody here because this stands out very well from the front from the background. So Understanding that, if you knew that somebody was in an orange shirt and you see this, it helps to make you understand that that's probably a person uh, because of the, that, that match. So that, that, that's something that's important. But you can see in all of these, it's not a big target. And again, if we're at a thousand feet, the target becomes even smaller. Big thing is the coloration of their clothes in that, is, depending upon what the person is wearing, is a big help in possibly being able to spot them. Finally, we have a signal mirror. Um, this is not the best, in my mind, impression, in my mind, the best picture of a signal mirror. If somebody's using a signal mirror properly in an aircraft, you'll really see it. It's a, definitely a bright flash of light on the ground. This doesn't really convey it too much, in my, in my opinion. So that's covering our basic uh, search and damage assessment. And uh, I'll move on to the next slide. If anybody has questions, we'll try to answer them briefly between the two, and I'm going to move on to my next presentation.
Okay, so we're going to move on to chapter 10, visual search patterns and procedures, where to some extent we'll put some of these, some of the te terminology we uh, talked about in the chapter 9 uh, to use. And basically what we're doing in this chapter here, we're going to cover what are the standard search patterns that CAP uses. And this is going to cover task 2027. So we're going to start off with a route search. The route search is basically used when an aircraft's line of flight is known or suspected and the aircraft has disappeared, but we don't have any information on its last known point. So simplistically what we're going to do is make an assumption that the aircraft crashed or force landed somewhere along its planned route of flight, and we're going to follow that route of flight to look for it. And here's what a route search looks like. Here's the ground track that we're going to follow. Like I said, the ground track is we're imagining a line on the ground that parallels the aircraft's line of flight. And so we're going to take this ground track, which may be if the pilot was flying from airport A to airport B, he had a waypoint in between on his flight plan. We're going to follow the route of that flight plan and hopefully try to find the aircraft. Typical spacing is one half of the scanning range. So that we're going to fly this all the way one leg. We're going to come back and we're going to fly the next leg. One half of the scanning range. That gives us, since we've got particularly a scanner in the back, an observer in the front, that gives us a search area that is our search area that's equivalent to, to the full scanning range. This here is our track spacing. We flew one leg, we come back for the other leg, and typically track spacing between legs is going to be a full scanning range. So what you see here in the route search is what you're going to see repeated over and over again with the other scanning, uh, with the other cap search patterns. The next here is a parallel track or a grid search. And a lot of the time searches we run are going to be uh, grid searches um, over uh, typically uh, over, uh, grid searches. Typically grid searches are done. We, we talked about, uh, Lieutenant Gugula uh, talked about the CAP grid system. And we want, broke the system down to seven and a half by seven and a half degree squares, logical squares. And typically when we do CAP searches, we're searching one of those squares, seven and a half degree by seven and a half degree squares. We're searching this, Typically, when, again, when we don't really know where the target is, we know a general area of where the target is. So we're basically trying to search, uh, an, instead of searching a line of flight, we're trying to search a geographic area for something that we only have an approximate idea of where it's located. Grid search is a very uniform search. It's very repeatable. So we can fly it now, and if we come back the next day and we fly it, It'll be the same search. So it gives us the ability to cover an area in a way that's that, that's consistent and repeatable. And basically the way a grid search works is we're searching like on a grid, right? We're going to come in on a defined area of ground that we're going to cover. Like I said, this is typically a seven and a half by seven and a half degree square, logical square. We're going to come in, enter the grid a half of the scanning range from the end of the, from the outside of our grid. We're going to fly to the end of the grid, turn around and fly the next leg. And again, the total spacing between the legs is typically one scanning range, whatever the scanning range is, typically a mile. That gives us I don't know if this works when I do this this way, so I have to go back and do this. That gives us this 
ability to have somebody with one half scanning range on one side of the aircraft, one half scanning range on the other side of the aircraft as the legs overlap. So our scanner and observer both work along a track from opposite sides as the plane does its scale, does its, uh, it, it, its legs. Typically, we'll fly this if, like I said, this is on a seven and a half, seven and a half grid. There may be aircraft in the adjacent grids. There may not be, depending. If there's not an aircraft in the adjacent grids, typically this pattern goes to the end of the grid and the pilot will turn around for the next leg outside of the grid. That gives both the scanner and the observer who are doing the looking a little bit of time to rest their eyes while the pilot is, is turning around to the next leg. If there is an aircraft in the adjacent grid, then we will turn around and within this grid. The next search pattern is a creeping line search. This is basically the same as the parallel track or the grid search that you just saw. Um, what it basically is, is a grid search that is, we went back to the route search originally, or we started with the route search where we flew along an aircraft's route of, route of flight or suspected route of flight. Basically a creepy line search is a grid search that is done perpendicular to a line of flight. Uh, usually we're gonna use it where we might know the aircraft's line of flight and we suspect that the aircraft or whatever the search target is, is some number of nautical miles on either side, potentially on either side of that particular ground track that we're trying to search. Typically for, for a creeping line search, we're using three miles. So here we've got a creeping line search. As I said, it's basically a grid search that's done perpendicular to a ground track of some kind. Typically, we space these out at three miles. That's the typical spacing. It's, of course, it's going to change depending upon um, the situation. And again, we're doing the same thing. We're going to enter this at some point. We're going to do one scanning range, typically one scanning range distance between legs so that each on the left and right side of the aircraft, depending upon which side of the leg we're doing, the scanner observer can do one half a scanning range to look out. We may use this a lot if we have an aircraft where we think something may have happened either after takeoff or on approach, and we wanna cover not necessarily the entire route, but we wanna cover that segment of the route that might be close to the, to the airport that the airplane took off from or was expected to land at, because we have some supposition that maybe something the aircraft got lost or crashed shortly after takeoff or on landing, but we don't have the specific information for that. So that's one of the ways in which we would use a creeping line search. Finally, the last two search patterns that we're going to talk about are what are called point-based searches. They're basically searches around a point. This case, we might have a last known position for our target, and we want to work out from that last known position to see if we can find our target. This kind of is basically, if you imagine, we're going to fly uh, a circle. In this case, it's actually a square, but we're going to fly an area so that we went back and talked about the probability or possibility uh, areas of the area of most possibility. We're flying basically to try to cover that area in a consistent manner. So an expanding square search, if you imagine this, we're covering what could potentially be a circular area, but we're covering it as squares. We typically, we typically enter at the last known point at a 360 degree heading. And the typical spanning square is we're gonna fly out a mile. We're gonna fly out another mile. The next leg then becomes two miles and two miles, three miles and three miles, four miles and four miles, where we basically fly two legs and then expand that size of that square by a nautical mile, the next two legs, 
cons uh, consistently going doing that in a expanding pattern for however far out from the last known point or the central point it is that we want to search. If that first search is negative, then sometimes what we will do is run a second search at 45 degrees. And this is to give, again, the more different angles or perspectives you can look for something, the more likely you are of being able to see it. So this is to give improved coverage and to give some varied viewing angles if we don't find what we want the first time. Finally, the last or the next uh, point-based search is what we call a sector search, um, which is largely a search around the point. It has some advantages over the expanding square and that it provides some concentrated coverage near the center of the search area because we're going to constantly be flying over that. The expanding square, you start at the point and then you keep moving away from it, moving away from it. With the sector search, we're going to keep flying over that point constantly. And again, it provides an area, uh, the opportunity to view the area from different angles. This is a little bit, it's not so much a complicated one, but it does provide, does require the plane to fly uh, depending upon how the sector is broken up, uh, a variety of angles. So usually it's planned ahead of time on the ground. But basically, well, if you imagine you're going to fly, take, a, take an area, cut it into pie-shaped slices, and you're going to fly each of those pie slices. That's basically a sector search, just like what we have here. So we would start here. We would fly this sector. We're going to turn around hit the next sector, fly it, turn around, hit the next sector, fly it, turn around, hit the next sector, fly it, turn around, hit the next sector, come back where we started in the opposite direction. And again, we would fly this as many times as we needed to or wanted to to cover an area. And you can see why this here, because of the angles, depending upon how many pie slices we decide to break this into, this is something that's better planned on the ground. Um, as a scanner, you're not going to necessarily be worried about or concerned about the planning. The planning is part of the domain of the mission observer. That's part of the responsibility of the mission observer is to plan or plot out as necessary the search patterns that we're going to that are going to be used by 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 the crew for the mission. And so the last pattern we're going to talk about is a pattern that you probably will not see much here in Illinois. Um, you may see it more out west or in the east where you've got more hilly or mountainous terrain, and that's a contour search. Basically, a contour search, if you imagine that you had somebody who you might think might have crashed into the side of a mountain or a very large uh, hill, you're basically going to want to fly around the perimeter of that mountain looking for your target, looking for your uh, object of interest, looking for your target. So basically you start at the top, you fly the perimeter, you descend 500 feet, you fly around that perimeter. This is basically something that requires special training because you're flying a half, excuse me, you're flying, again, a half of a scanning range, typically a half mile, around something that's got continuously changing terrain and you're trying to hug that. So that requires that does require special training. And here's basically what that looks like. We start in at the top, we fly, descend, try to follow that terrain as well as you can, descend to the next one, keep following that terrain, descend again and keep following the terrain. And you can see where this is does require pretty good flying skills and, and some special training because you are got to keep pretty consistent over what's always changing areas. So that's the last of the search patterns. Practice, practice, practice. Practice helps us to do our things. That's what A-12 missions are for. A-12 missions are pilot proficiency missions. 
the squadrons have, if I remember correctly, two missions a month that are funded by the Air Force. And the pilot can take up a crew. So we could put together a air crew with a scanner and an observer. And everybody can practice their skills or with a scanner or with an observer and an aerial photographer or a scanner and aerial photographer. We can take up a crew. Everybody gets a chance to practice their skills. We get an opportunity to do a couple of those a month. For most of you folks, I suspect you're already familiar with the A-12 missions. Uh, everybody does them, but definitely this is, you guys want to practice and practice. So that's the end of these two presentations. If there's any questions regarding this. And if there's no questions, I think we actually are done for the night. Okay. So, Steve, you have anything? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, the, I guess, uh, Mike, you want to throw that slide back up with the, the test information? Sure. And, and the one thing, uh, yes, give me just a second. I'll throw that back up. You said the test is this Friday? I thought we have MRO on Friday. Yeah, I think I may have thrown that out there by mistake. I, uh, it's next Wednesday. It's next Wednesday. So a reminder here, everything that's on the test is in the scanner reference manual. You know, everything that we've gone on the slide simply covers in an abbreviated form what's in the scanner reference manual. So um, definitely, if you haven't been, you know, I, I, we've been telling you to, as, as we go through week by week, make sure that you read the material in the scanner reference manual that, that corresponds to the chapters we've been showing the slides for. And if you kind of review that material, you should have no problem with passing the test. It's like I said, it's all multiple choice, true or false. Most of the questions are such that you could probably just from the question itself go back if you have the PDF open for the for the reference manual, you could go into the manual, find where that question is, and, and be able to pull an answer out to it. So that's, that's it. it. That's it. Anybody have any questions? I know we're a few minutes behind, so I appreciate everybody sticking around. So the test is uh, next Wednesday, same time? Correct. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, make sure everybody has their information in the chat. And before everybody leaves, I'm going to put something a link in the chat here. Um, if you're from Illinois Wing, you've already gotten this a couple days ago. But if you're from outside the wing, the link I just put in there is the um, – uh, is to access the recordings for all the trainings we've been doing if you want to go back and review them. Um, so just uh, check on that. All the recordings are in there. Just look at your leisure if you want if you want to review things or if you weren't able to attend a course, you can go look at that as well. So but other than that, um, I got nothing else. Sounds like the instructors are done for the night. So I appreciate everybody coming on and um, See you. Uh, some of you probably out on Friday, if not a lot of you next week. So, so have a good night, all. Good night, everybody. Hey, Kirk. Yep. For the squadrons like Champagne that doesn't have a aircraft, how?